If you want to know why the two Senate runoff races in Georgia are, without too much hyperbole, a matter of life and death, think of taxes. If we want to fund all sorts of great social systems like health care for all or paid sick leave, well, the rich will have to pay a lot more and corporations can't get those damn tax breaks just simply to fund their astronomical CEO pay and benefits. But that ain't happening as long as Republicans control the Senate. And I will also say I feel certain, pretty certain, that so-called Democrats, enough of them, will be wavering and waving the flag for tax breaks for the rich in corporations. At least, though, the fight must be had in a vigorous, unrelenting way, and not just at the federal level, but in every state. So to look at the state of play around taxes, here back on the show is one of my favorite smart people, Amy Hanauer, the executive director of the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy. So when we last spoke about this stuff about taxes, Amy, and you and I dug into this, it was pre-election and we were sort of forecasting what might happen and what Biden's tax policy might look like. The problem that I want to raise with you is not so much Biden, but the reality is that at the federal level, it seems to me that all the important things that you laid out in your amazing writing, both uh, in the Hill column that you wrote and on your website at itep.org, you lay out some really important things to do. But it seems to me that in the best case scenario, if we are somehow lucky enough, the Democrats meaning, to win the two Georgia seats, you're going to end up with a 50-50 tie which, as you quite well know, is a student of government, but I want to remind my listeners as well, that means that Kamala Harris would be have to be on the job at all times near the Senate to cast a tie-breaking vote. But even in those circumstances, you've got people like Joe Manchin and other more conservative Democrats who are not going to embrace the kinds of things that I think you talk about, higher taxes on the wealthy, significant potentially wealth tax, and all the important things to do. So I'm wondering whether you know, best case scenario, it's all going to be frozen in place from your point of view. Yeah, I don't think it has to be that way. Um, just starting, starting with Joe Manchin, the one name you mentioned, I mean, I don't know why the senator from West Virginia should be scared of a wealth tax, you know? I mean, we- uh, Good have, point. You know, we have a country with enormous inequality where wealth taxes and higher taxes on wealthy people in general and higher taxes on corporations are enormously popular. We have an outgoing president who lost after cutting taxes for the wealthy, cutting taxes for corporations, after making it possible for 91 profitable Fortune 500 companies to pay nothing in taxes in the first year of his tax law. And we have an incoming president who talked a lot about raising taxes on the wealthy and on corporations while he was running. And he won handily with a huge share of the popular vote, with a solid share of the electoral college. He won in conservative states, you know, he won in, in progressive states, and he won while talking about raising taxes. So we ought to go in and fight for an economy that actually works for working people and that raises money from those most stable to pay. Yes, I love that, except for the reality is that, and you pointed out Manchin and some of the others, they seem to be not caring about for example, your point about West Virginia, that there are probably far fewer billionaires in West Virginia outside of, say, mining billionaires uh, than, say, in New York City, if you look at the billionaires who got their money from Wall Street or Silicon Valley in California. But, but still, their ideology drives it, and Manchin might as well be a Republican, for all I care. I'm just being practical. And in a minute, I'm going to actually shift to ask you the question, does it make sense to focus our energy and our hopes, if you will, at the state level? Because you laid out some really incredible stuff that has actually happened at the state level. But just to stick for a moment at the federal level, maybe I'll ask it in another way. What are things that Biden can do around tax policy through executive action that wouldn't require Congress to act if there are such things? Right, right, right. Well, um, so here's the thing. I mean, first of all, I don't think we have to 
shy away from legislative actions. Like I do think that there yeah. is a legislative agenda that is a protest agenda that would bring about a lot of economic fairness. And if you look at where the economy is right at this second, um, you know, the economy is about to go over a cliff. States are being slaughtered in terms of their economic prospects. And we can talk more about mm. that in a second to follow up on that part of your question. But, um, you know, I, I think he ought to come out swinging. And frankly, I think it would help in the Georgia um, special elections to mm. come out swinging to say we ought to have an economy where we tax the rich, where we tax corporations. And we do that to pay for COVID relief, you know, to pay for the fact that we've got 10 million fewer jobs than we had at the beginning of this year. We've got a lot of people out of work. And we've got enormous costs to get this vaccine out and get it out to people and get our economy back on track. So I think we shouldn't shy away from that, that kind of an approach. Um, there are a lot of things that I think can be done without, without the legislature, certainly in terms of regulatory reforms. Um, there are a bunch of things that Trump made worse under his presidency in terms of not enforcing the tax code. But there are also just things that were bad before Trump came in and he left them bad. And so mm. we should take those on as well. And I, yeah, sorry. I would, no, I was just going to say, I totally agree with your point that we should push as hard as possible and make the most boldest demands. And certainly people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren in the Senate will be voices for that. Sherrod Brown comes to mind, obviously. I was just asking as a practical matter, because actually the way I was going to segue the conversation was, do we have much more brighter spots to work on? Let's say we get stonewalled at the federal level, which is is possible. And alas, being somewhat an observer of that for the past number of decades, it's always obvious to me that Democrats give up and are always negotiating at against themselves before the fight even begins. So at the state level, there's so many interesting things that have happened. I think of my own state of Oregon, where we just passed, and I actually worked a little bit on this, a tax on the most wealthiest folks in Multnomah County, which is the county for my audience that includes Portland, Oregon, where there was a, going to be a tax to fund pre-K for everyone. And then you mentioned, again, I urge my listeners to go to itp.org and really read Amy's column about the options and the things that could be done at the state. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. And Marco Guzman on our staff has a new blog today with some more about state wins and losses on election day. Um, well, the Multnomah County uh, was, was really a personal favorite for me because I have always loved talking about just Pre-K or child care is a great example. It's a great way of describing how we could raise more revenue and it would both help working families, position the next generation better, relieve poverty. Like it's just such a win, 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 win. And in your case, one of the things I particularly loved about that was that in addition to expanding access, I can't remember if it was pre-K or child care. I think pre-K, right? But in addition to yeah. In addition to expanding access, it also raised wages for the teachers and the aides working in that profession, which, of course, I know from your long history is near and dear to your heart, right? Like, we cannot win in the pre-K system if we set struggling families who are attempting to pay for one of the most unaffordable things in anybody's budget against teachers who are attempting to make a living and deliver great care and deliver great education to our youngest kids, you know. So that was just a really, really touching little example of what a local community can do. But at the state level, statewide, we also saw some wins. I mean, this year, New Jersey passed a millionaire's tax to fund COVID relief, particularly focused on the lowest income families. It's also going to fund some health care and education expenses in New Jersey. That's a great example of a state making their tax code more progressive, taxing those most able to pay, paying for some essential things that are going to address racial and gender inequities um, and, and then address economic inequities at the same time. So my home, to, I, I spent a lot of years in Ohio. A lot of people think of me as an Ohio person, but I was born in New Jersey and I was very happy to see that happen in my home state. And then and when you're Arizona, born in New, you're always in New Jersey, girl. When you're born in New Jersey, it never leaves you no matter where you are, right? Always. And, you know, after a drink, you can hear it even more in my voice. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, Arizona, which is a much more conservative state historically, um, 
you know, the, that was one of the places where the Red for Ed teachers' rights mm. movement really emerged strongly a couple of years ago when their, you know, schools had been cut to the bone and teachers had really had it. And there was very careful, thoughtful, ongoing organizing that went on in Arizona. And as a result, on election day, they passed a higher tax on the highest income um, households in Arizona to pay for schools, to pay for better schools and smaller class sizes and better education for kids in Arizona. So those are just two examples statewide of really good results on election day. Um, you know, other states should should jump on board. And I'll just say, I mean, Meg Weehy, my colleague at um, Deputy Executive Director at ITEP would kill me if I didn't. Um, most state tax systems are upside down, meaning mm -hmm. that in most states, um, we require lower income families to pay a higher share of their income in state and local taxes than higher income families. That's the opposite of how it should be. It's upside down. What we really want is state tax systems that have those most able to pay, pay a higher share so that we can have benefits that kind of cross the economy and do it in a way that those most able to pay can, can afford. And couldn't you in states like Oregon, which actually does not have a state sales tax, which to me is mind boggling. I don't know how you can uh, actually have a long term survivable budget uh, and really do what needs to be done in this state and other states when you don't have a uh, state sales tax. Couldn't you do it in a progressive way? For example, couldn't you first of all have a sales tax just to get the camel's nose under the tent that just targets, for example, luxury items, say cars over, I'm just going to make up a figure, $50,000 or uh, diamonds, jewelry, things which are really targeted at those who are much more wealthier, and then exclude things like food and stuff that people need to survive. Yeah, well, many um, well-crafted state sales taxes do exclude food and clothing, um, and sometimes there's differentials in what constitutes clothing. Um, but we are actually huge fans of the progressive income tax at the state level, more so than a sales tax, because the sales tax mm -hmm. is almost always going to fall more heavily on lower-income families who, of course, spend almost everything they earn, while wealthier families can save more of what they earn. Um, and so, you know, we, we think a progressive income tax with several rates so that you pay one rate on earnings up to $50,000, one rate on earnings up from 50 to 150 and, you know, and so on. But with top brackets that are like a half millionaires and a millionaires bracket, that makes a lot of sense because there's a big difference between um, those levels of earnings and most states even if they have a progressive income tax, have failed to kind of let those uh, adjust as the economy adjusts. So progressive income tax and corporate taxes are like our go-tos for state level taxes. But we, you know, we think sales tax has a role to play in that as well. Yeah. I just wanted to make the point. I totally agree with your point and you are the expert at this, that sales taxes are not inherently uh, all regressive, that you can structure them in a way that are better, but you're totally right. The burden should be on uh, corporate uh, taxes and high wealth income taxes. I totally agree with that. Sure, and and just you know to to kind of have an add on to that, you know, you see a similar thing with similar thing with property taxes, where you could have a mansion tax, for example, or a tax on second homes that was higher than the tax on first homes. So there's a lot of ways that you could do things, um, you know, recognizing that homes are the biggest assets that most middle income families have. Most poor families don't have homes at all, but they end up paying the property tax as a pass-through as renters. Um, but that there are ways to structure these that better tap. And then of course, and you'll love this, you know, a home is the biggest source of wealth that most middle-income families have. For wealthy families who have a lot of their wealth in the form of stocks, um, you know, those those aren't earnings from stocks are not taxed at the same level at all. And then we have no tax whatsoever on that form of wealth. So we have this sort of discrimination built into the only form of wealth tax that we have, which is a property tax. And then we, we don't end up taxing, you know, uh, huge stock portfolios. Right. And that's essentially the underlying idea behind Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax. And Bernie Sanders has proposed that as well, that you really take a, a big chunk out of this enormous wealth. I mean, you know as well as I know that um, over the past several months during the pandemic, a handful of billionaires have raked 
in tens of billions of dollars more in wealth. And it's just astounding to me that the people are not out in the streets basically calling a general strike until these people give back some of that money. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's really outrageous. And it shows that that Joe Biden has a long way to go, right? Like he could do everything that he talked about during the campaign, all of which is very popular, taxing people with earnings over $400,000 a year, raising um, income taxes on that group, raising um, corporate taxes. But he could, you know, he didn't talk much about a wealth tax and there's clearly room to do that. It's very popular. And it's just very justified given the way our economy has changed because that ends up being huge intergenerational transfers mm. uh, that just accumulate and accumulate in a capitalistic system like ours. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention one other uh, development that I think is it's not a direct income tax, but it certainly is being paid by corporations, which is the incredible success of the campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour in Florida, where it passed overwhelmingly 60% plus at a time that Joe Biden was losing the state. And I actually went and did an analysis, which people can see on my new newsletter, and it's also on our website, workinglife.org. And I went county by county, which, trust me, is a torturous procedure. And I looked at every single county, and in every single county, even the ones that Trump won, that ballot initiative overperformed Joe Biden in some places quite significantly. And my point to that is that while it's not a direct tax in the way you and I were discussing, it's extremely popular across the nation that the average person should benefit more, that we should make sure that people get more income, that the wealthier pay more in taxes. And certainly in this case, when it comes to the minimum wage, it is coming out of the corporate coffers. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, you know, I worked in Ohio in 2006 to raise the minimum wage. It was one of the happiest, you know, achievements of, of, of the years that I spent in Ohio. I think it's incredibly important. And I think you point out a really um, crucial and underappreciated aspect of it, which is that the tax policy, fair tax policy and fair wage policy are two sides of the same coin. And in addition, you know, first of all, if we have adequate taxes, it enables exactly what we were talking about earlier. You can pay teachers better. You can pay all these public sector workers better. And that's a lot of good working class and middle class jobs. It's a lot, you know, public sector jobs are a huge way that people have joined the middle class historically in the United States. It's been a huge route out of poverty for the black community historically and for new immigrants coming to this country in every wave of immigrants throughout the 20th century. So when we have a more robustly funded public sector, we can pay public sector workers more. But furthermore, this is kind of a funny flip side to it. You know, in a lot of other countries, a lot of things that are that individual families or individual people are responsible for paying for in the United States are just kind of part of what you get as a citizen. And that includes pre-K often, it includes um, higher education often, it includes transit often, you know? And so um, you have these places where if you take those three items out of the individual family budget, if, if public transit is essentially free, and college is, you know, low or no cost. In Germany, it's pretty much free. Um, and pre-K is low or no cost. Then families, really, it's like giving them a big raise. So yeah. there's just other, there's a lot of ways to get at this, but minimum wage is absolutely, it's the thing that Americans understand best about class. Um, and I would throw into your great list broadband, which should be yeah. a public utility and everybody should get free as well. That would be a huge savings for, God, millions of people, especially in this time when we're reading all, very frequently that all the folks staying at home, disproportionately, people of color and poor people are being hurt. Their kids are being hurt because they don't have easy access to broadband to do this distance learning. Yeah. And then you'll, you'll probably kill me if I fail to, if, because we both oh, left yeah. out healthcare. You know? Yeah. I mean, come on, right? Every other country, yeah, of course. Just, it kind of comes with comes with birth, pretty much. Well, this is a great transition to the final point I wanted to talk and you uh, to you about, and you kind of um, telegraphed this, which is 
the situation we're in right now with this crazy stimulus talk. And it does relate directly to your expertise on taxes and state funding, which is it's kind of astonishing to me. And I say astonishing at a moral level, not that these politicians don't ever surprise me with their immorality and their inability to see what the actual people need. But if you go state by state and you look at their budget situations, it's dire because of the pandemic. And every state either has already drawn up budget cuts or is in the process of drawing up huge budget cuts because they don't have the tax revenues right now because the economy has collapsed. And those budget cuts are going to hit people, prolong the pain, prolong the economic decline, the slump, the collapse, because it's going to cost people, millions of people across the nation, their jobs. Lots of people are employed, for example, in the public sector. And it's just astonishing to me that as part of this stimulus package, it's not a no-brainer to basically give states huge relief on the order of half a trillion dollars, maybe more. Yeah. Well, you, again, you're rescuing me because one of the main things that my organization, Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, works on is supporting all of these phenomenal state level think tanks as they fight for better tax policy at the state and local level. Because if we, what we did wrong during the Great Recession is that we just we failed to enable states to maintain their employment and to maintain the things that they pay for for people. And so it really prolonged the recession, in addition to depriving people of basic things that enable them to thrive. So it is crazy to be kind of counter cyclical in that way, to use an economist term, right? Like we've got to put money into the economy right now when a lot of people's private um, paychecks are diminished or eliminated. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure we don't have to lay off teachers and um, sanitation workers and firefighters and, and everybody else who's employed by state and local government. So if you had your magic wand and you were given the power to basically shape um, this stimulus package, how would you do it that relates obviously to state funding, but also in terms of tax policy that then could serve as a basis for things going forward. So at the next crisis, we wouldn't be in the situation. And I'm thinking, for example, making sure that we have funded through tax policy, paid sick leave and paid leave. So people, when there is a pandemic and they are ill, can actually stay home. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love when you give me a magic wand at the end of an interview. And so, love, you know, yeah, I have um, this great power to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, I think that there is just it, the reason that this COVID epidemic and this recession has been so hard in the United States is that we were really ill equipped because we had high rates of poverty going into it. We had high rates of people lacking health insurance going into it. We had high rates of essential workers who didn't have paid sick days and didn't have the ability to take a day off when they felt sick and didn't have the ability to fight to be protected in the workplace. Um, you think of the meat packers, um, you know, who, who've been so uh, victimized in meatpacking plants throughout the United States, where there have been huge outbreaks and they haven't had the power to take a day off or demand personal protective equipment. Um, so, you know, that's a fundamental flaw in our economy that not only hurts people and hurts people every day, but means that we were positioned to do particularly poorly under COVID. Um, mm. So, Going forward, we know that we've got to get, we've got to distribute this vaccine. We've got to get people protected. We've got to get money back into people's pay, into people's pocketbooks, and we've got to get money back into state coffers. But we also know going forward that we still don't have universal health care, that we still are not doing enough to prevent climate change, and that we could create a lot of jobs in this country simply by addressing some of those ongoing problems of underinvestment. So we should, you know, raise money from those most able pay. We've got many, many millionaires and billionaires, and we've got many profitable corporations that can easily afford to pay more. And we can use it for, you know, a second new deal, uh, whatever, you know, salutary phrase you want to use to describe it. But to do what we did, and we did it inequitably in the 20th century, but to do some of what we did in the 20th century, which is to invest in our people and think about the problems of this future and put money into solving them and addressing them. 
All right, then. So we're going to end towards the end of the year, waiting for all this to kind of play out as the new administration comes into office. And you are going to come back on this program and we are going to debate this about what actually happens, you know, to see how it all plays out both in Congress and at the state level. As usual, thank you so much for giving me your insights and giving my audience your incredible knowledge about this tax issue. Always so much fun to talk to you and I look forward to coming back.